Hello, fellow songwriters, and welcome to the fifth episode of the How Songs Are Made podcast, where we talk to notable artists about their songwriting process. I am your host, Trey Xavier, and today we're going to be talking to the Juno-nominated band The Agonist about the songwriting process for their recent EP, Days Before the World Wept, which is ultra sick. I have been binging it over the last week, and really enjoying it. Today's episode of the podcast is sponsored by me. And my brand new songwriting course, Complete Rock and Metal Songwriting. If you are like most musicians, then you've got hundreds of riffs and intros and ideas written and no finished songs. Well, in this course, I show you how to go from any little nugget of an idea to a final full-blown song arrangement with all the trimmings. So sign up for the course at the link in the description, and I'll see you there. So before we get up and running, um, Days Before the World Wept was released on October 15th of last year. It was produced by Christian Donaldson, who's done a bunch of amazing records. Um, It's the band's seventh studio recording. So please give a very warm welcome to Vicky and Simon from The Agonist. There they are. Hello. Yo, yo. Hello. How are you guys hey, doing? Everyone. Good. Um, pretty I'm, dang good. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for taking the time <laughs> uh, to talk to me today. For some reason, the uh, the little Zoom window is poking way out of the uh, side there. Hang on a second. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh yeah but it's working we can see you and and they can hear you and um so uh where are you guys located each and uh, you're in different spots right different places yeah i'm in chicago and i'm in montreal where most of us the rest of us are um that must that's quite a commute for band practice <laughs> <laughs> yeah we don't we don't really practice unless there's a reason to like unless we're going on tour or we have a show or we need to write an album then i go to montreal or record an album not write an album sorry um but yeah thankfully yes. we can do that now through the internet and all that <laughs> um especially that's uh, no there i fixed it there i fixed it yeah i mean it seems like a um of all the times to uh, have this kind of a problem, f- you know, it could be could be a worse time, you know. Like, Im- remember what the internet was like in like 1996 or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> like, how? What would music would just grind to a halt? Like, nobody <laughs> would put out albums, nobody would record them. That's not true. You could use like a, a telephone and like <laughs> call each other and be like, "Yo, dude, I got the sick riff," and like. <laughs> Send it. I know for a fact that's how certain people like auditioned for bands back in the day when there was no other way. That's true. I guess you had to, yeah, if you do a long distance, be like, you got, well, what's it? Oh, in uh, Back to the Future. Hey, this is the, listen, check this out. It's the future of music. And he knew, just heard it over the phone. <laughs> so exactly. um, that uh, actually is a great it's a great segue. It's a terrible segue, but we're going to use it to how you wrote um, this EP. Um, was it written during the pandemic, first of all? Most of it. Uh, some of it was, well, we had one song that we redid from 2016, was it, Simon? When did five come out? Or 17? Don't make blank. me use Google for my own releases. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, we have the song Resurrection that we re-recorded and uh, remixed and all that. And then we had two songs that were written kind of around the same time that Orphans was written, which we also recorded this year. Um, and then two brand new songs that we, we wrote during the pandemic. Okay. So... Yeah. What was the songwriting process like for this overall, and how is it different from how you've done it previously? For, I guess for the for the songs that mostly were were the brand new ones, more than anything else, but just in general. 
Simon, you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. I mean, <laughs> well, like we kind of were saying in the beginning, through the use of technology, we uh, were able to get it done. And um, one might say even more efficiently than, you know, the old school organic way of showing up in a jam space and bouncing some riffs off and not saying there's not, you know, excellent benefits in doing it like that, but we were able to organize everything and basically bounce ideas back and forth and add parts, remove parts. You know, it's all, all becomes quite easy when you have the tools, right? Yeah. So, I mean, for a lot of our older albums from back in the day, we did kind of write in the jam room, but I think, uh, actually we started doing that around the orphans period, I think starting using Cubase more and, doing that possibly um, even before i know that um maybe you ha would add something vicky to that but yeah um, you're drawing a blank sort of right now um i think you started getting involved in using cubase during the orphans period um danny and i were doing it i think since i've well not i have providence since five i have providence i think you guys still wrote in the jam space hmm. old school style um then we started doing it on five and i think orphans was around the time that you started like for the first time programming drums i think mm -hmm. yeah uh although i do have a memory of like sitting on an electronic drum set with like you manning the console as it yeah. were at yeah. danny's at danny's apartment yeah old apartment so and that was for like, five five so <laughs> yeah. yeah it might have even been resurrection the song it was that was, it was one of the yeah that was one of the first ones we wrote off five um and i just remember that like i mean i know how to use cubase but i'd, I'd never like recorded drums um <laughs> the only stuff i'd done with with midi was like keyboard stuff so like simon was playing and he's not used to drum kit electronic drum kit i'm not used to editing so there's all these like dots in Cubase, I'm like, what does any of this mean? And I just got so upset. I got up and I'm like, Simon, fix it. Today you're gonna learn how to edit drums. <laughs> that very well may have been my introduction to it. Yes. <laughs> That's the uh, like the the genesis of the of the creative process with with the DAW. Like I same like I just wanted to be able to record and write things myself without having to. I don't know without being a slave to other musicians, like having to bring people in. So I like just banged my head against the wall over and over again until I could use Pro Tools. <laughs> and and, that, and then it's like, all right, cool. There's probably an official way to do this, but I don't know what it is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The number <laughs> of times that you're like, well, I learned how to do it this way. And instead of like walking in a straight line, you're kind of just doing that. And someone comes along and is like, but did you know you could just like, there's a shortcut and you're like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> and you're like, ah, oh, the hours of my life that I'll never get back. Yeah. It could be um, something so simple too as like, you know, the hot key for like setting your marker at the beginning mm -hmm. of the riff that you're working on instead of, I'm saying this for, out of experience <laughs> because I'm all constantly clicking on the grid. Okay, I have to go here. Ah, oh, I didn't click it properly. Like, come on, there has to be a better way. Of course there is. Of course yeah. there is. Um, so let what were the two songs that were completely brand new on the, uh, that would be? yeah, remnants in time and days before the world wept. Okay. So, um, how did like, let's, uh, just pick one of those. Let's, uh, let's talk about remnants in time. Cause, um, that one sticks out to me as, as a standout. Um, even though they're all pretty fucking amazing. Um, that one like really kicks it off. How did that, like, what was the initial um, seed of the idea and how did it, like, grow into a complete track like it is with all lyrics and, and the big, like, layers of vocals and everything? Like, walk us through it. It's okay if it's from you guys' perspective. I mean, I, I don't know how, yeah. you know. Yeah. It's just funny that you chose that song because that one, that one we had a lot of, a lot of back and forth to turn it into what it was whereas days before the world web was a lot more like when danny because uh danny's not here with us today but he <laughs> usually starts like writing songs and then we add to it um so like 
the difference between the two is insane. Like he wrote Days Before the World Wept and the changes we made were very minor. Like, you know, um, Simon did his his drums, obviously, and I, I asked for some lead guitar melody changes so they don't clash with the vocals, but that was like, here it is, it's a song, it's great. Uh, Remnants in Time, on the other hand, the first version we heard, I'd say like 50% of that actually made the final song or something like that, Simon. <laughs> I'd say that's actually a perfect example, like the most interesting anyways, as it was not the most like smoothest of songs, but ended up like in terms of writing, but ended up being one of the, the better songs. And yeah, it was basically like, um, it was quite progressive ish before as yeah danny is the main songwriter and like he'll start writing and so he had started this song and it, it really went somewhere it, it went somewhere different in the beginning half of the song let's say and it was just decided to just basically basically start from like halfway point and like of what was written and start the song from there and then from that point we added all the bells and whistles on the inside and then you added the piano on the outside mm -hmm. on both sides. Yeah. So we kind of just like chopped off like, and that's really hard to do. You know, it's not easy to govern yourself like that and yeah. to, uh, you know, not censor yourself, but govern yourself. Yeah. I don't think we've ever, like maybe you guys have done that in the pre-prod phase before I even received a song, but I don't think we've ever taken a song and ripped it apart like that and been like no these riffs don't fit you know toss them write new riffs make it work um up until the very last part like the up until the very last day i was drums were done bass was done everything was done guitars were done i was driving to montreal to record my vocals um and i was staying with our producer chris donaldson and there was still one riff in the song that I actually kind of wrote like I did like a piano version of it and Danny transcribed it and then I told him I don't actually like it how it sounds on guitar. Let's try and think of something else. And nobody thought of anything else. And I true. just show up. Yeah, I show up to my producer's house. And the first thing we do is we crack open some beers because we, we love like uh, craft beers and I brought some as gifts um, from the States. So we open up the beers and like a few beers go, go and I'm like, Chris, I don't like this riff. What are we gonna do? <laughs> and Chris is like, I'm gonna write a riff now. You know, and we just go to his studio. Like we're both kind of drunk. He's trying to play guitar. He's trying to play on his, I think, B tuned guitar for a C tuning song and transcribe everything on the spot and he comes out of it just being like this is the best river riff i've ever written and you know goes to sleep wakes up the next day he's like okay it was it was a pretty good riff but it needs some work you know sorry i, I really got sidetracked there but but the point no, is this is this is exactly the shit that, that i'm <laughs> looking for this is gold great great yeah but but the point is that like ev for that song we really like pushed it to the very end um even the piano, like I wrote the the intro piano, and there was no, um, there was no like, we, we didn't decide to have a piano at the end. Like it wasn't said, it was just the song ended and the song ended, I think it ended with bass. Um, and then we were talking with uh, Chris Kells, um, our bassist who also does our music videos, and we were like trying to figure out the visuals for the music video and I was like, oh, it'd be great if it comes full circle. So like I'm there playing piano in the beginning of the video and then like I'm playing piano at the end of the video. And he's like, but there's no piano in the song. And <laughs> I'm like, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> um, and even that, it was like the last day, like my last day here in this goblin basement. Um, like before Ew. driving to Montreal, I just turned on the piano and I isolated just my vocal part and I started playing to to my vocals. And I just remember sending it to Simon that night. And I'm like, do you like this? And Simon goes to bed like a normal person. So he wakes up the next day in the morning and he hears it and he's like, it's perfect. I love it. And I'm like, good, because that's it. I can't change it. Like I'm leaving. I'm driving tomorrow. This is it. <laughs> yeah, that's heroic. <laughs> that's really interesting um 
that the music video would influence the song when I because I love music videos. I think it's like it's like probably my favorite art form, like just the combination of music that I love. And like it's almost like you're reverse scoring something. You know, like if you make a score for a TV show or something, you're making music to fit what's on the screen. Music videos the other way around. I think that's so cool. Um, And uh, when I'm writing, I'll often picture what the music video might look like for a song. And the the visual aspect of it has a has a pretty big influence on how the song sounds sometimes. Um, And that's a great example of of that kind of like because you're you're thinking of the story more yeah. so and like songwriting is a, is storytelling to some extent and um that's that's pretty great i love that um yeah so you were you guys were ruthless with the uh with the <laughs> arrangement you you <laughs> yeah chopped a whole half of the song off as it was presented to you and uh and just focused it more so i guess yeah that's cool i think that's important yeah i think it was just like like we're we're known for for being like experimental and like mixing up genres and stuff like that i just feel like maybe that song originally was too many different too genre bending but not in a good way necessarily um because i think you don't really know until the vocals are on a song and when I was listening to it, like the original version of that song, the ideas that were coming to me vocally were just too, it was too like, this isn't going to work. Because sometimes you could have like genre bending riffs and then the vocals come in and they make it cohesive, you know, but the vocals that I was going to put, it was just going to be night and day as well. And I'm like, well, this just sounds like two different songs. So why, why not make them two different songs? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I find that more ideas tend to be less exciting than than a few really solid ones, like make it feel a little more like like it's got direction. Too many ideas, like kitchen sink style, can be like distracting rather than interesting. You know. Um, yeah. So how d- like. Um, is that a typical way that you guys go about, like how much influence does the band of, as a whole generally have? Like if, uh, um, you say the guitarist is writing the the majority of the music, I mean, that's pretty typical. Like guitarists love to, love to write riffs and, and songs and parts. And then like, is this good? Um, <laughs> but like, <laughs> um, how often do you get th- that, that deep into it and, start eating parts of the song and all that would you say i think that starts from you guys so simon if you want to take this one because like i know i miss a lot like by the time something is presented to me they've already you know gone at it (laughs) yeah well i mean it will start with um danny's like pretty good at writing like full songs to present like you don't always come up with an idea that's conclusive sometimes you come up with like part of a song like i also write you know a lot and I'll, that's my problem is I, I always you know write to a certain point and then it's like okay i'll come back and finish it because i'm not inspired but danny's pretty good at usually writing from front to back so then he'll do that send it to me i'll put uh you know, I'll, I'll lately have been programming drums and getting pretty good at it. So I'll program the drums as to what I know I can play and what I would want to hear. Um, sometimes I'll also take it to our jam room and play a little bit to just the, the, the tracks and that will adjust the way I can program. But through the programming of the drums, things will happen that are inevitable. Like for example, oh, um, let's just chop off this little one last bar here and just make it a silence, like a cut or something. So that when it just goes bang and then like the next riff is more you know, um, explosive and stuff like that will happen when I'm doing the drums and like that Danny didn't necessarily think of, or I'll, I might think of another idea on guitar that I want to add over. So usually the drums will get programmed after the guitar is laid down and that's pretty much the meat and potatoes of it. Um, and man, it's just, it's been so long since we've done this that it's like, I have to like recall it's, it's been like, it's been been years by now. Well, it feels yeah. like forever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's basically how it gets off the ground. Yeah. Yeah, I think like Danny does like 
you know, he does his own parts to the full extent. And then he kind of mimics everyone else's parts. So like uh, Paco, for example, is our lead guitar player. So he plays like most of like the, the technical solos that you hear. So Danny will even mimic that. He'll like record mm -hmm. a very basic melodic solo just to be like, here, Paco, take this, do whatever you want. It's yours. You know, um, the only thing he doesn't mimic is the vocal parts. Um, he's sent me some lyrics in the past. So have you, Simon. But for the most part, like, I've pretty much done whatever I wanted in terms of vocals. Um, so what happens like after they've done this process and I get the song, it's just kind of like, okay, this is what I have to work with. And often it really depends because like, okay, when we, ha when we have like a chug, a chug riff that's like not playing much, like maybe it's just like the root or just like a power chord. I feel like I can do whatever I want. It's cool, it's fine. The problems start when we when I get like a dense part in the song and there's like three layers of guitar and drums are blast beating and this and that and I'm like okay suddenly I'm I'm in a box um, especially when there's like dissonant chords in the guitars and and I want to come in and put like layers of harmonies and choirs and stuff like that it's like oh this is too much so I think the only times that this happened on on this EP was. Uh, Remnants in Time and Days Before the World Webbed where I just kind of went a little bit back and forth with Danny and I was like, hey, try try altering your chord to this chord instead and that'll open up my um, the possibilities for me to add choirs and stuff like that without being like, okay, these are the only two tracks I can do because we've exhausted all the notes and anything I add will just sound wrong, you know? So um, there's that. You're like, leave then, some notes for me, please. <laughs> Just leave some space, yeah. guy. Come on. Yeah. There's that. And then I feel like the other issue that maybe we have sometimes is that I feel a lot of our riffs are written for vocals. They're like vocal riffs. So then I end up like recording all my vocals and I'm like, ah, shit, where am I going to breathe now? Um, so insert riff. Like, like that first riff that comes after the chorus of um, Days Before the World Wept. You guys added that afterwards because I'm like, I can't, I, I can't, like, I've been screaming and singing the entire time. I need a break, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, that was like, you had, we were like talking about a certain kind, like, we need like a, a breathing room uh, of groove. And then you're, you really like the groove, like the certain groove. So we just decided to take that part and just like extend it. And yeah. then, and then I actually added this little trippy alien lead over that. And then that part became like, just one of the coolest parts of the song because it's like a little breather like you said right after the chorus after all this epicness happens and now it's time to just headbang and just yeah. like okay now i'm getting back into the groove where are we going now and just that little segue just because of a random idea like i need to breathe ended <laughs> up just being so cool yeah seems like that that's the kind of thing where writing the kind of old school way bunch of people in a room writing all together which has a lot of drawbacks i think but that that's the kind of thing that gets picked up in the moment because yeah you're actually singing it with the whole band and you're like <gasps> <sighs> you know you're dying and you're like we got to put something here but in the studio yeah. you could just get through it you wouldn't even notice that until it's your first time to play it on stage and you're like oh shit yeah mm -hmm. yeah which I do to a certain extent. Like I know when I'm pushing my limits. I know when, okay, maybe this part isolated isn't that hard, but by the time I get there, I'm out of breath. I'm dying. I, I can't do it. Like I was talking uh, last night actually on the stream. Um, I was I was singing Resurrection and someone asked me um, on Twitch on the stream, sorry, just to clarify, yes, on Twitch, I stream on Twitch. Uh, someone asked me, he's like, how, what parts are hard for you? And I'm like, it's not necessarily that the part is hard. It's just everything that I've done leading up to that part. If I'm out of breath, if I can't support these notes, it's going to be a disaster. And Resurrection is a perfect example of that because like the end is just these like crazy high notes and it just goes higher and higher and higher on what's already a six seven minute song i don't know six minutes i think so yeah 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 it's sometimes you're you're battling 
between like experience like i know i shouldn't do this because it's gonna be hard versus oh but the song would sound so cool if i just did this yeah that's <laughs> like you're at the end of the race you just ran a marathon and that finish line is there and you're just like okay just go just gotta burn it just burn it give it all you got just like and running on fumes until the last stretch of the oh finally except for then we play a live and then we gotta play another song I remember reading this little bit about um, Bon Jovi, like they had, you know, poor dude, like burn himself out so bad because there's like a, I don't know, a high G or so some ridiculous high note in uh, Living on a Prayer. And they had to go out and sing it every single night on tour for like 10 years. And they didn't, you know, when it was, they're writing the song. They were just like, let's just do the sickest thing. You know, we got John Bon Jovi just kill, just woo. Sounds awesome <laughs> on the recording. And then 10 years later, he's like, why? Why did I do that? <laughs> God, kill me. End my suffering. Um, And that's that's hard to consider when you're just sitting there at your keyboard and you're like, this note sounds great there. But you're but you do think of that is is the main thing. You're considering that to an extent. You're considering the your physical limitations yeah when you do it so the question is what school of thought are you what school of thought should one take should we go the let's not think about that and just go all out go push it to the limit max it out see what happens figure it out later or do we go the conservative route of well i know i can execute this perfectly but am i am i pushing yeah. it I think like with everything balance is key like i think there are physical limitations um that will never like this is still going to be a problem like you know one year two years three years from now ten years from now um versus um limitations that if you train hard enough and if you take all the necessary precautions you can avoid that happening um so like like from my perspective adding a super low note let's say or a super high note that has to be like that's at the edge of my range and it has to be like a great day for me that's a limitation that i would never take on a main vocal part in a song because you're literally tossing a coin will i hit it this day or will i not um but adding notes that are like not at the edge but like right before the edge that i know that like okay maybe don't headbang like crazy don't run around right before this part comes um you know make sure you're standing you're able you're you're able to hear yourself to hit that note then it's okay so it's like i think you you have to weigh like what what limitations are you know forever and ever in time versus if I do everything that I need to do, it'll be okay. Um, yeah. To me, that's I, one of the yeah. parts of being, sorry to cut you off, of being a professional oh. is knowing what you can do and what you can do really well. And yeah. knowing your limits too. Yeah, because th the last thing I want to say is like, I think you need to, to take those chances sometimes. Like you need to push yourself because if I go back in time and I remember certain things that were really difficult for me when I first did them, some of those things today, they're not hard at all. Um, and it's like, I got over that hurdle and that difficulty by just doing it and doing it and doing it again. And it just becomes second nature at that point. Yeah. Um, I think that's an important um perspective like you have to when when somebody writes a song let's say like the like um like a guitarist or a keyboard player or something like writes a song and writes parts for everybody else like guitar is hard but it's also it's also kind of easy actually in a lot of ways compared to vocals and drums i'm not just kissing your ass because you're the vocalist and the drummer but like those are the like those are the athletic parts of the band really like the drummer is running in place the whole time if they're, if they're playing metal just about um <laughs> and uh that's like a you know like a full body athlete and like i mean the the there's the, the singers 
like it's it's also a full body thing but like more so your your system right and th- those things can't you can't change the strings on your voice or the you know change the drum heads on your throat um so you have to be a lot more careful about it when you're in the composition part of it it's got these long reaching uh effects unlike um I don't know, like a, a keyboard part that will be part of the backing track <laughs> or whatever. So that's really cool to hear how you go about it and how you're thinking about it more than anything else when it goes into the songwriting part. Um, I'm curious about your approach to the lyrics on this. And um, is is there any continuous thread throughout the EP? Um, any kind of concept or anything or how you went about that? Yeah, it, it it is a concept EP that like accidentally sort of happened. Like we had, as I mentioned, the three songs um, that were older. And I saw, even though they weren't written to be connected, I saw a connection there. And I was like, okay, what if I just write? It was great because then it gave me the ideas for the, the, the last two songs um, to just kind of connect the dots and, and make it flow and be a concept EP that wasn't originally planned to be that um and i think the the beauty in this ep is that each song on its own has its own meaning um but then it's like a piece of a larger puzzle as well kind of like those tv shows where it's like the whole season there's a plot going on but then each individual episode has its own like theme too Mm -hmm. right um so i mean without going into like crazy, crazy details, because I could talk about this for like two hours, maybe Um, the it it dabbles with like afterlife. So we have like a protagonist character that remnants in time, the very first song basically dies. And it just shows us his journey through like um, purgatory and going to to hell and back and being resurrected and coming back to this world, which is the last song days before the world wept. That's and not the world he remembered. Um, it's everything's kind of very different, very distorted, very difficult. Um, and just to answer this question that a lot of people ask when they see the lyrics on that song, did you write this about the pandemic? Uh, no, because <laughs> I actually wrote these lyrics in um, 2019, I think, like before any of this happened. Um, I just think that like, what's happening right now with like COVID and pandemic and all that. It's like a recurring thing in time and history that, you know, humanity and mankind has had to endure. So I think my reference reference points were like other historical events, I guess. Um, But yes, that's, that's the general theme of the lyrics. Okay. So um, the way that you've described it, um, aside from you going in and, and chopping parts a bit like on the on remnants and time and all that and um you're generally getting pretty well fleshed out tracks and then basically top lining um on top of them with changes so you'll come up with uh from what you've described i think it sounds like you'll come up with something and maybe be like "Mm, this lead guitar part is making it hard for me to sing on this can you change this note that kind of thing um how do you what's the like general process for how you go about doing that uh, just just writing your parts in general when you get one of these tracks um i it's very strange like i the lyrics and the melodies kind of come at the same time at least the placements like i'll have one or two words that are popping like i'm one of those people where when i think of the melody in my head there there's a line there there's a sentence it's not just the notes um And maybe I won't keep that sentence as is in the final version, but maybe I'll be like, oh, but that word was great, you know, and I'll build the rest. Um, But I think ultimately melody comes first before the lyrics. I never want to write lyrics that'll like make my vocals too like crazy and like I'm trying to fit them in music that it just doesn't fit, right? It doesn't Mm -hmm. work. So, um, So basically I focus on the melody and the placements first not necessarily the exact notes, but like the patterns, like the the length of the notes and how many will be in this part. And 
I like to think ahead. So I kind of write the main part with some harmonies at the same time. So if I'm getting this impression that like here, I want this to be like a big part with like a lot of intersecting melodies and stuff like that. I can't just finalize the main vocal without thinking of the other layers. Is it going to work? Is it not going to work? So I kind of do all that at once. Um, and having a keyboard and knowing chords and stuff like that is a big, big help. Uh, so what I'll do, I'll, I'll transcribe the guitar. I'll literally isolate the guitar layers and record them on my piano and then put that all on a MIDI and see what's like conflicting. And sometimes dissonant chords are great. I love dissonant chords and you can just go in with the vocals and accentuate um that but sometimes it's just too much so like if there's like one guitar layer that feels like oh maybe don't don't put a, a d sharp there put a d instead so that the vocals can whatever i don't want to get too technical here but yeah you can get it's, as it's technical a back as and you forth. like <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a back and forth and then like I, I have some vsts too so like i'll i'll um record that on a midi and i'll put like a fake lead guitar sound you know and send it back and be like hey can you record this with an actual guitar um and send it back and um yeah it's it's really cool that we're talking about this too like because yesterday um i was on on twitch like i mentioned and i actually opened up a project and it was the the demo project for days before the world wept and remnants in time i opened both yeah and I was just like, yeah, here they are, big blocks, colored blocks of vocals and the layers and yeah. <laughs> so you're really you're really diving in and dissecting stuff to make it work the way that you want it to. And uh that's that's amazing. I've I've worked with some people who are just like I don't I just is this you I make it better. This is bad. This is bad, <laughs> fix it. Um, but you, you're like, no, I'm going to find that note and I'm going to fucking zap it and you're going to do yeah. it the way that I want it. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes it's a mistake. Like I remember this, this is funny. This is a, this is a pretty funny story. Um, it was at the end of the bridge of days before the world wept right before the last chorus. And there were a lot of like layers there before I did the vocals and there were like three guitars. And I was hearing this really weird note. It was like a, a, a harmonic, what do you call it? A pinch harmonic or something like that. But it was off. It was like, let's say like, I, I don't know what the scale is there, but let's say it was supposed to be um, an A sharp, it was a B. So it was causing like the semitone, whatever madness. And I tell Dan, I message Dan, I'm like, is this intentional? Cause like, this is too far. <laughs> and He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Let me open the project. So he opens his project. He goes through all the guitars. He's like, is this what you're talking about? And it was this like, like tiny, like little, like a really high, like thing that was just so out of the scale that like accidentally happened when he was recording his guitar. He's like, he told me if I tried to redo this, I wouldn't be able to. <laughs> and... He was like, yeah, he's like, how the fuck did you hear that? And I'm like, it was so bad. It just like, that was all I could hear. And then he re-recorded it, that one part. And I was like, oh, sanity. Thank you. <laughs> Relief. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it, it was a high note. It was a high frequency too. If it was like in the low end, I feel like it could have like slid, you know, flight under the radar. But it was like the highest note in the guitar layers. So it didn't matter that it was like, lower in volume it was still just like you know grabbing my attention and not letting me focus so yeah sometimes having a good ear is annoying <laughs> it ends up being good a good thing it's a blessing and a curse it's kind of like people who have a uh, perfect pitch they say that that exactly it's a blessing and a curse because you'll yeah you'll hear it and you know exactly what it is and what how far out of tune it is and there's yeah. nothing you can fucking do about it if you're just like listening to music you know you'd be like yeah. yeah i can hear that the second violin in this is 23 cents out of tune guess yeah. i'll die <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, i've met people like that yeah it's like I, sometimes I want to go back and like untake all of my ear training 
shit in college just so that I can enjoy music the way that I did when I was like 15 or whatever. You just don't care. Like, this is shit. Yeah. That's a that's shit actually, riff. That's actually, you got to think like that, right, too. You got to have yeah. that. You got to you gotta harness that, too. And it can be hard to, like, peel off the layers of, you know, training or what have you. Yeah. You got to yeah. grab people that don't know anything about anything and they just want to hear good shit, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's sometimes like, and that's that's another battle. Like, I know we trailed off the discussion here, but like that's another battle when, when you're a perfectionist like that where you're like, you just got to like sit down and be like, okay, does it really matter? Like what percentage of people are going to hear this and notice it and be upset by it? Um, and... <laughs> I feel like I've I've gotten better, um, at least this year, because like I literally spent I have spent like you, you mentioned in the beginning, uh, hours and hours on something. And then it's like nobody noticed. And I'm like, well, is it worth it? You know, I'd rather spend two minutes of my life on something and <laughs> and people notice it. So it, it's a battle. I just think when it comes to like layers of harmonies i just feel like that is the reason a lot of people enjoy like pop songs and catchy songs and they don't even know it because if we go to like the biggest hits there is like an ocean of layers and harmonies back there and you think you're singing along to the main vocal line because that's the one that's prominent and you don't realize that those layers in the back are what are bringing that out and making it stand out and if you remove all those layers, you're going to be like, oh, this song isn't as good anymore. So I feel like it's one of those nerdy things that it's like, okay, maybe people don't understand, but it makes a huge impact. And you're tracking a lot of huge uh, like layers of choir sounds and stuff like that. I think it's important to get it really right because if there's, it's less whether or not you're the ones sound good that you're recording the main ones almost all of them 99 percent of it if you ha it's just like you were saying if there's one shitty note in there it's like getting a turd in your soup like it's not it's you don't go mm, this is a delicious soup except for this right. turd like you're just gonna go like <laughs> Ooh, like that does not sound it doesn't sound good it doesn't sound right there's Poison. something fucking wrong and the average listener isn't gonna go Ah, see what they've done here is there's a flat nine on this chord where normally you would want a natural. No, that's just they just go like, now nah, this sucks. Next, exactly. So, yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, being a perfectionist in that sense. Um, I'm curious sure. if you have any particular systematic way that you go about uh, layering these big choirs of parts. If you like, um, by the time you get to the studio to record those are they already very well stacked and written the way that oh, you want yeah. them to <laughs> everything's that? done everything's done in advance because like the last thing i want to do is show up uh and, and tell my producer like yeah i want to build a big choir i have no idea how to do it you help me we're gonna figure it out today no i i'm not gonna do that um mind you he's still probably you would do it like what he would do it Oh, he, he would, would do him. it. He's the nice guy in the world and he <laughs> wouldn't complain about it, but he still I'm like he I can still see like the oof boy like look in his eyes when when I tell him that we're doing a choir here even though everything's already done. Just cuz he knows it's going to we're looking at like 40, 50, 60 tracks. I don't even know. He's also um, probably thinking where the heck am I going to put these things in the mix? Yeah. Like I'm going to place them here, here, here. It's like a yeah. smorgasbord of pins on the <laughs> yeah. Actually, now there's no problem with like the latest version of Pro Tools, but I think in Orphans um there was a limitation to the tracks. So he had to mix all the choirs into like one stereo track and put them in uh the other project cuz he reached his peak of tracks, which oh, wow. I don't know what it was. But uh, now there's no more limitation in Pro, Pro Tools, so it's not a problem anymore. You've um, broken Pro Tools, Vicky. <laughs> Did it. Well, not just the vocal tracks, like all the tracks he had on the song, obviously. But um, anyways, yeah, the process. Um, I like, I start by the, the standard stuff, right? Like the classic thirds and octaves where are needed and stuff like that. And then I see where I can 
supplement like with a sixth or a fourth or fifth, wherever it makes sense. It really depends like what the music is doing. And then movements, movements are important. Like you have to make sure that your melodies are intersecting. They're not following the main vocal like pattern. So like if the main vocal goes up and down and up and down, you don't want your harmonies always doing that with the main vocal. It's it's static, it's boring, uninteresting, you know. Um, so I play around with that a lot. Sometimes I'll have, uh, like I was, uh, oh, we said this before the, the, str the stream started, but um, like I'll record like the male voices. I'll try, you know, so like I'll, I'll change my voice and like, you know, make it more like, yeah, or something to, <laughs> to just kind of like fake, you know, male voices. But sometimes instead of, let's say I'm doing an octave lower from a female voice, I won't have the exact same melody. I'll, I'll change it up a little bit. So like, let's say the, the female vocal went up, this one can go down instead. And just like, yeah, stuff like that to make it interesting. And I guess another thing that I think is really important when when mixing choirs well sorry with choirs is mixing them properly so um don't don't hard pan every single track like maybe keep some tracks that are only on the left or only on the right to kind of mimic kind of how you do with drums right so Simon something you can relate to when you hear a drum set in the mix it's not centered it's not you're not hearing every drum hit everywhere like some things are only on the left some things are only on the side and it opens up like that whole uh uh frequency spectrum so yeah. kind of do the same with with backing vocals it's kind of nice when you have like only like a high kind of pop up on the on the right or the left or whatever so it's it's a tedious process but every little bit is important i remember being in some choirs in high school and um college and Thank God it was a choir. Nobody needs to hear me singing by myself. Um, but they, the way that they've, uh, over the years of vocal choir music, um, you know, th sort of mixed it in real life before there was speakers or microphones or anything, was to have the individual sections be in certain places to emphasize that the same thing that you're talking about, like that same idea sort of, mixing it and same with like a like a symphony and all that they have thought about all of that in a certain way and put them in certain places tried different things over time and i think whether or not people consciously consciously realize it they are used to hearing it that way and if you are thinking about that when you're rec when you're writing and, and recording and mixing that you can kind of play off of that and uh I, I agree. It sounds it's it's a makes a big difference because then it's not just this homogenous mush of of parts. You can hear the individual things, and that's part of what makes yeah. it cool. Yeah, so, I actually yeah. saw. Sorry, before we move on, I just saw a comment in the chat. I feel like maybe I should talk about this. Just uh, well, two things. One person asked how we re recreate this live. We obviously put it on backing tracks, <laughs> just like any band that writes a million keyboard and sound samples, they're on tracks. There's like even bands like Epica, you know, there's there's Kuhn, he's playing the main keyboard part, but everything else is on tracks. Um, so yeah, there's that. And then there's one comment saying, Abba used to put really out of tune Bvox into stacks to make them sound full. So that was another, that's a very important thing too when you're recording um, choirs. You don't go in afterwards with the pitch correction and make them perfect because you're going to reduce those 60 tracks into like 10 tracks. Because imagine if you had 60 people singing at the same time, they wouldn't have the exact same pitch. Um, so yes, you have to preserve that natural, you know, no auto-tune on choirs basically. <laughs> So wait, then this person is saying that ABBA used to like get together after the actual good takes were done and be like, all right, boys, let's uh, let's do a bunch of crap. <laughs> like, let's, uh, just like wing it. I don't think they did it after. I think they mean like the in-between, like, oh, this wasn't quite you. perfect. Let me do it again. But let's keep that not perfect take too. Well, let's open some <laughs> beers, boys. Let's get this done right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
You t- that was a great take. Now do it shitty. <laughs> <laughs> Said no one ever except them. <laughs> um, so I'm I'm a little curious about whether or not you guys have studied this stuff in any sort of formal capacity. Um, it sounds like you know a pretty good bit about what you're talking about. Um, I'm always curious because it's pretty rare in in rock and metal that people study it. Uh, I mean, some people do, but I'm curious if you guys have any formal music education or if you've even just studied songwriting and theory stuff on your own. Simon, want to go first? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, in my case, I'm... It's funny, the only lessons I've actually had were for the instrument that I don't primarily play, which is guitar. I had guitar lessons. I started off playing guitar at like around 12 years old, eventually realized I could play some drums, and then I just learned drums on my own, and then everyone needed a drummer, so I ended up being a drummer. (laughs) Fast forward to today. Um, But no, I don't have any drum lessons, any, you know, training for drums or just a bit of guitar, just a general sense of guitar and melody and Honestly, I did have some. I, I I tried to go into like a, a music school, and it just was not for me. It just was not for me. And it's funny because I scored like like ninety five percent on my ear training exam, and then the written theory was like horrible. It was like five <laughs> percent. Like I just was like awful. So there you have it. I'm just more of a by ear kind of guy, I guess. That's just yeah. me though. Yeah, yeah, and and Simon has a great ear too. Like. Uh... He's the one in the band that like sometimes will listen to a song and like kind of just like do harmonies and stuff like that on the spot, which you can't do if you don't have a good ear. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess my my journey is kind of similar. I I've never had any like formal lessons when it comes to to music theory or anything like that. I'm I'm self taught. Um, vocally, I've only had like maybe a year or something of like classical singing lessons. Um, so that's how I'm able to do the choir stuff. It's not, it's not me mimicking, you know, soprano voices. I actually learned how to do that the right way. Um, but everything else vocally, um, self-taught and music self-taught. Um, although I do know my basic music theory. So like I, I taught myself that, but I think the, the thing that helped me out the most, and this is why I criticize, uh, guitar tabs don't get me wrong here i just criticize guitar tabs because i feel like (laughs) i know i was so scared to say that but no i feel like i also i I don't like guitar tabs there you go i feel like it's a very easy way to learn how to play but but if you're self-taught you're not really learning you're not really training your ear um i learned how to play most things well i I don't play songs really on the piano but every time i hear a song i'll turn on the piano and i'll try to find the chords using my ear and sometimes as a shortcut i'll like look up chords but i think that's more useful than learning tabs because tabs don't explain theory at all it's just like put your hands on these tabs each finger there and play it you know um so yeah i think uh sorry going back off my rant from for guitar tabs but um yeah feel free to rant at at any time on any topic that's what we're that's what we got you here for show us where the tabs hurt you vicky (laughs) yeah the tabs hurt me very much i rant a lot people know this people that follow me know that i love ranting um but yeah so self-taught um and what actually i think what helped me as like a preliminary getting into vocals and layering was I started doing it with music first. So I downloaded, um, I first used this this program called Reason that was free before getting Cubase. And I had a um, MIDI keyboard. So I would record like a little piano riff, like usually an arpeggio or something. And I'd be like, okay, let's add strings. Now let's add a a moving violin and let's add a bass. And like, I had no idea what I was doing, but I've listened to a lot of soundtracks and video game music in my life. That's like, that's basically what they're doing. They take a recurring theme and they just build and build and then change it up. So it's like, I got into like layering first from an instrument standpoint so that when it came time to do it with vocals, I think I was already like, I had some experience in it. So it wasn't that hard to do. 
And I'd say at the end of the day, just like trust your ear. If it sounds off, don't don't try to justify it. You know, if it doesn't sound good, there's probably a reason it doesn't sound good. Yeah, I think the tabs thing is the like like the give a man a fish, teach a man to fish thing. Yeah, tabs are just giving him a fish. It's like okay, <laughs> here's where you put your fingers to play this song the way that it was recorded. If but if you want to write. That doesn't really help you almost at all because, uh, to, to a certain extent, because you're learning patterns on on the instrument and on guitar patterns or everything because you can just slide them around and get the same sound in a different key. But like, if you don't have at least some system of naming them or or keeping track of them or something, then you haven't learned how to make more music from that. Um, and t- tabs are, tabs are cool. Like I was a guitar teacher for like 10 years. And if there, if tabs didn't exist, I'd, uh, I wouldn't really ha- have had a job, <laughs> Yeah. but, but yeah, like, uh, even just what you're describing this sort of like primordial, like beeps and boops and reason and, and just like stacking stuff based entirely on what you think sounds good is incredibly important i think the sandbox the sandbox part of writing music yeah you got to play you got to learn how to play yes yeah but then yeah. then there's that next step of like that a lot of people don't take a lot of people get amazing at their instrument learn how to play tons and tons of covers or they join a band um where they can you know somebody else is doing most of the writing and i think a lot of people who, music listeners assume that that's the same skill set because they're like, Oh, you're an amazing guitarist or whatever, but they can't write to save their lives. Um, just, it's just a different, a completely different part of your brain almost or different subsection of the musical part of your brain. It is. I don't, I don't think you can necessarily teach creativity. I think a person has to be creative to begin with, but I think you can expand that. I think if you have that natural inclination and you teach yourself some stuff, you don't have to go to school, but you need to like have an open mind to be like, okay, what, what exactly am I doing here? Let's, let's try and, and, and figure it out. Let not just like be like, yeah, I'm winging it every single time. Um, I think you can take your creativity to, to a whole other level. Um, but I've definitely met a lot of musicians that are like exceptional and like, great guitar players great drummers great singers and they can't write for shit and it's okay not everyone has to be a writer like i know some people that that do music for the live performance aspect like all they care about is going on stage and rocking that guitar not everyone has to be a songwriter um so that's fine but if if you do and if you love writing songs i don't see why you wouldn't want to take that next step step and you know, learn some more. It's it's definitely not going to kill your creativity. It's just going to help you, you know, transcend and get better at what you do. Yeah, that's that's how I look at it too. Um, I th- I think there's this idea, this like very polarized idea of like either you're gonna just be self-taught and learn completely by ear and like fuck music theory. Or you're going to go to a conservatory and read everything off a page, like learn how to sight read. And like, I don't think it's like that at all. I think there's a very, there's a huge gray area in between. You can learn a lot of things that that are useful from the sort of formal education, music theory, ear training, that kind of stuff. And you don't like, it doesn't, it's not going to make you, the, the end result of that isn't that you're going to be in a, in a tuxedo playing like concertos or anything <laughs> like that. It's, I don't know. I guess it's yeah. weird to me the attitude of a lot of rock musicians, who, uh, yeah, you could just learn stuff and it's it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. Not gonna hurt you. <laughs> oh, the reality sure. of life is that it's not black or white in anything in life, right? It's Except for gray. a tuxedo. Yes, that would be awesome. By the way, <laughs> it's great. You know, you got to You got to take bits and pieces that make sense to you from wherever you can. And just put it all together. Yeah. Yeah. So it it's uh it's always cool to hear like people's philosophy on that um especially when what you're doing 
comes out so awesome. You know what I mean? Like if you got if you were uh like yeah I never really learned anything whatever and then your music sucked I'd be like cool I'm gonna go I'm gonna <laughs> go get another music degree so that we could be <laughs> but as you've demonstrated as, on this EP uh, especially like you're using this approach this sort of blended approach of of thinking of it um like you were saying chord tones and like stacking these choirs kn- like knowing like oh this is the fifth maybe I don't need another fifth in this part or whatever, like like a little bit of the theory and formal harmony aspect of it, but also just using your your ear to guide you um, and then applying a similar approach to the, the way that you've arranged and, and write this, all the parts of the songs. It's obviously working great because <laughs> you trust yourself. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, well, thank you, first of all. Um, I just, I feel like, first and foremost, we write music because we want to write music, and it's for us. And, like, we do it for ourselves, first and foremost, and then for everyone else. And I think if you're not progressing, and if you're not making these, like, taking chances and, like, uh, experimenting and like trying to grow as an artist, then I feel like songwriting itself would become tedious and boring. So I think we as music- musicians, we have to do that anyways. And it's it's even better when other people in the world end up liking what we do too. <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious about how much influence anyone outside of the band has um specifically the producer in any at any given moment um like at what point in the process do you bring in other outside opinions um and how often do you actually listen to them or you're like eh, you're going to leave it as it is so uh, specifically for this ep and then how has it compared to doing it in the past I'd say that there's very minimal asking other people what they think about the creation process. Anyways, for sure, when we're done-ish, when we're done the the demos, or actually when we're done the album, we might even, like, we bounced this off of people that we know to see what their reaction would be about the tunes. But in terms of, like Vicky mentioned, that one part um, in Remnants, that Chris Donaldson basically wrote. But otherwise, I think we're pretty much like, I don't think we really ask for other opinions until things are basically done, right? From other people. Yeah. And it it took seven albums and how many years of knowing Chris Donaldson for him to write a riff? Because he's like, he's also like a super nice guy. And I keep telling because he has a great ear too. Um, He's well he's he he has a formal education right simon he he's gone to music school and all that so um he's an excellent musician and i feel like he's just so goddamn nice like he could just (laughs) he could step in and tell bands you know what this part sucks do this it'll be better you know and he just doesn't because he doesn't want to impose he thinks his job is just like i'm just gonna mix this to sound good but like i would very much be open to like his criticism on something, you know, as as an artist, especially like the stuff that I don't know, you know, that he knows more about. But I think outside of Chris, we don't really have anyone else that could just step in and be like, eh, you, you could do this better or do that better. Like all of our friends are just music lovers, you know, we don't really share our tunes before they're released with, with people that aren't our friends you know so yeah i'd say that my fiance is a not unwilling but unwitting um outside opinion as she incessantly hears whatever demo we're doing over and over and over (laughs) and over (laughs) yeah oh man yeah (laughs) the only person who will ever hate your music more than you do by the time it's done like (laughs) everybody goes through that you know as you're you write something you're excited about it you hear it a hundred times as you're working on it 
by the time it's you, you're listening to the tenth master revision, you just wish you'd been a dentist or whatever. But that's <laughs> you, and you have to love it. The people who live with you have no such like inclination. They're like, all right, maybe yeah. you get your own room for doing this stuff <laughs> and yeah, we soundproof enough. it. But I, I have to say, though, I'm I, I don't I've met very few people like this that I'm weird, I guess, in the sense that I listen to my <laughs> band's music. Like I'll listen to it from the demo stage. Even after we release the album, I still listen to the EP I just did yesterday. I listen. I just I don't know. May, maybe it's because I'm an arrogant idiot. No, I'm just kidding. No, it's because I just love my own stuff. I mean, how can you got to love your own stuff? If you can't listen to your own stuff over and over and over again, you should do something else. I mean, it's my opinion. You should love what you do. And like, I love listening to our own stuff. Man, my Spotify numbers came up the other day. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> You're like, I can't share these. I'm going to look like such a narcissist. <laughs> exactly. That's the word I was looking for. Narcissist. <laughs> yeah. Not arrogant. Narcissist. Yeah. But I don't care, man. It's, I don't think that's narcissistic at all. I, I write get, the music that I want to hear in the world. So I'm happy yeah, to listen totally. to my own music. Like it makes me, it gives me a good feeling inside. It gives me a little buzz. It's like, yeah, man, like we did this awesome music. Like this is so amazing. Now I'm ready to like go about my life, you know. And I'm just reminded of how awesome this music is that I had a part in. So yeah, I see it. Yeah, no, I I agree. I I I wish my my only thing is like I wish we could hear the final product like the rest of the world does. Unfortunately, we never can. Um. And I just wish there was like a, like the thing in Men in Black where it's like we can choose to erase those particular memories just for a second, just to hear the song in its final form, but then bring them back, bring the memories back because I don't want to forget the songwriting process, obviously. Um, and we'll never have that as musicians, but at the end of the day, you know, I listen to our music too. Um, maybe not as much as like the demo phases, but I do listen to the final final product too after it's out and I think it also helps um from a performance standpoint because like if you hear it enough at least like from a vocal perspective if I hear my vocals as they are on the cd enough times it's easier for me to replicate it afterwards because like you know singing is just that replicating what you hear so if you hear it enough times you're you should have an easier time doing it cool <laughs> yeah um i like i personally usually have to get past the like a, a few weeks out at least from the final version until i'm like ready to go back and, and listen to it again um but yeah it's if you can't listen to your own stuff you, I, you probably usually can't expect anybody else to want to listen to it too i guess but i don't know <laughs> I, i've met people who just never just don't listen to their own stuff ever because for whatever it, reason it some people can't do that but they'll still go out and play it and hmm. be in a band but i mean a lot of people are doing music just to like get something done it's like okay i'm gonna play an instrument on this song and it's like they don't have that personal attachment to it but if you're making like music from your original project that you you know probably should have a personal attachment to then i think that's rather normal right but i think it's also very normal for people to just be like yeah i come in i did session on this song whatever they're not going to go and listen to it a bunch but if it's something you feel yeah. really strongly about and it's your own original music well you should probably be able to listen to it over and over again and not get tired of it yeah definitely and and i know i get like all giddy when when i'm asked about like specific things um like if someone's like really dissects a song and they're like this this particular vocal part or this particular lyric i'm like oh shit you noticed that that's so awesome and like i feel like like i'm crying on the inside that that someone noticed this like minor detail or something that i put there you know it's like you feel proud in a sense is there sort of in a in a similar vein is there anything that you've done in the past on past albums that you specifically did not do on this one? Something that you maybe got sick of hearing, like maybe you thought that you've done it too many times or whatever. 
that you were like, ah, we're not going to do that this time around? Mm, Simon, I don't know. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think. I don't think we per se like made a list of things not to do. Um, maybe unintentionally some some things happen like that where you're like, okay, like maybe if you're a band that always like has an intro before every song, then you're going to be like, okay, no more intros, you know, but like, to be honest with you, I can't think of any particular thing that we decided, okay, we're, we're not going to do like that particular thing. It's kind well, of, we don't have a, thing. we don't have a ballad on the CP, I guess. Right. But it wasn't like exactly intentional. It was more no. functional of a yeah. decision. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's like you said, there's there's probably a lot of stuff that we, first of all, it's five songs, not 10, you know, so h half an album. Um, but I think, yeah, I don't think we, we sat down, you know, collectively and said, this, never doing again, this sucks, never mind. I think it was just organic and there's some things that we didn't do uh, simply because it either just didn't fit the theme or it didn't, we didn't naturally feel like doing it i guess but there wasn't anything specifically you know like predetermined like i know i can think of like more back in the day i recall being like okay like we like from the beginning when i first joined the band I'm like okay we have to be careful with breakdowns right because breakdowns and metal was especially back then in the early 2000s like a thing like everyone's doing breakdowns a song starts with with, with a breakdown and like not saying we had a bunch but we were like let's like be careful and like by now I just was thinking about this the other day. I don't really think there is a, in the metal sense of the word, like a breakdown on Days Before the World Web. Like there is a chunky, there are chunky syncopated riffs, but I think that whole like idea of like, one, two, three, four, China, like that's just like not there. The halftime China of, that means it's time to die. Like that influence of that is there, but it's not like in an obvious way. Like there's halftime China riffs where I'm playing syncopated with the guitar, but it's not necessarily a breakdown. It's like a part of the song. So that's just one thing that I think happened like a long time ago. Where, like if it's going to be a breakdown, it's going to have to be like a melodic breakdown or like not a, like a typical breakdown that everyone is used to hearing. But we definitely did not even think about that. <clears throat> no. No, I think, I don't know. I think our music is just like naturally like, what is the rest of the metal world doing? What's trending right now? Let's do the opposite. <laughs> let's like, let's shoot ourselves in the foot forever underground, whatever, <laughs> as long as we love it. <laughs> is there anything uh, that you did on this one that you've never done before? Oh, well, I played piano on, mm -hmm. oh, well, no, well, I like thinking about it. That's not true because I did, I did write piano on previous stuff. I never played it though, mm. so I actually played piano um, on this one. Um, I don't know about you, Simon. Drums. I'm trying to think vocally. Um, I don't know. No, I, I can't think of anything. I, I was gonna think of. I was gonna say the piano right away. Um, yeah yeah no i don't think there's anything new i just think um i think the mindset was probably a bit more fresh on this release we were just like you know let's let's just do what we want to do just write some good music there weren't any barriers there wasn't any like i think we should do this and like predetermined things we just wrote what felt right um i think from a vocal perspective I didn't do anything that I haven't done before, but I think I was, I, I opened up the spectrum a little bit more in terms of dynamics. Um, one issue I think I felt I had when I first joined this band that I felt that the vocals always had to match the energy of the music. So every time I would sing, I would, I would go for like pushed chest voice rasp, you know, I would not, not always like on 10, but like, the dynamics would be like above a six always. Um, whereas here I was like, you know what? Let's just add a one. Let's add a very soft singing part. Who cares that there's a blast beat going on right now? Mm -hmm. Just embrace that like contrast, I guess. So I think I just let myself go a little bit more and just 
did what I felt like doing without thinking too much. <laughs> That's actually a great answer to the question that he asked. That just through talking about it, you came up with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's so true. That's exactly what I'm looking for. I I think that a lot of the time you don't consciously change things in a certain way, you know, you but over the course of doing a lot of albums a certain way, it's just naturally kind of happens, you know, you write five songs for the EP, you go like, well, I'm not going to write this song again. It's time to write something new. So of course, something's going to be new. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That makes it makes sense. Um but you're I, I guess the um the main gist that I'm getting is that you guys do things very intuitively. There's not a there's not a lot of um charts and graphs and uh, I would say that's correct. Yeah. What are they called uh, uh spreadsheets <laughs> 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 or anything like that. Um which actually kind of seems absurd in a certain sense, because the music is crazy <laughs> and very technical, uh, intense. I, I would say that of your music that I've uh, listened to before, it this EP seems a bit pr almost proggier, like in certain spots there's a lot more... Um, like it, it always feels very cohesive, but there's a, uh, there's a lot of crazy changes and stuff that are happening and all of that so to the i don't know uh to the uneducated average music listener they might be like these guys must be on some fucking math shit there's they must have there's some fibonacci right. sequence in here they they must write this on an abacus um abacus I guess. abacus abacus <laughs> um nope. but you're but it you're just feeling it out yeah I think the 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 origin of songwriting should be feeling it out. That first stage. You just got to let yourself go and and write what feels good. And then you can start thinking after the groundwork is laid out. Like you know, my my first vocal melody that I'm going to sing over a song is feeling it out and maybe I'll change one note here maybe i'll change one note there because it's like oh this clashes a little bit with the music but i don't start thinking until the idea is on on there on cubase recorded and then i'm like okay let's see if this actually makes sense you know proof of concept yeah you get it out of your brain like you think that this is gonna work and you just you're like it feels good at the moment at the time and then you, when you hit play, then your analytical brain kind of kicks in and you. Exactly. That didn't work at all. <laughs> Sometimes, yes. <laughs> okay. That's good. That's, um, that's, that's good to know. Um, that's good. Uh, you're, you're, I don't know. I personally, I, I overthink everything all the time. Um, so I love hearing from people who, don't <laughs> just you're like <laughs> great trade now i'm gonna go and overthink everything as i'm writing it i used to enjoy it and now it's ruined um <laughs> i have a, a qu so you've got some um like orchestration stuff on here too right or am i hearing or it's just those are just choirs i th i yeah. guess i thought uh, i was hearing some orchestration and stuff on there but it's it's all just your voice then yeah wow all me it's probably what like the 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 wannabe male choir voices you're probably hearing you're like that can't be vicky it must be an instrument <laughs> maybe i just assumed that because i'm hearing a lot of uh layers of stuff that there's also some orchestration in there but yeah. um you're you're the orchestra orchestra of vicky yeah yeah she you're not the orchestra yeah, I am the orchestra. Yeah, you're not the first, by the way. Like, I saw a few people say, like, choirs and strings and keyboards, and I'm like, no, the only keyboard on there is the, the piano. Uh, but I think I think it's just like, like you said, because sometimes those things go hand in hand, right? What band yeah. writes choirs without writing, writing orchestras as well? Um, but I think, and, and I've answered this, like, before, like... Um, why sit there and do it with my own voice and not just, you know, get a plug in. And I think 
it's because like at the end of the day, I want to make an original product that someone else can't replicate. It's like, like making chocolate chip cookies from scratch versus buying the, the, the cookie dough and just baking it, you know, like anyone can do this. Anyone can download East West, uh, gold edition, symphonic orchestras and put those notes. And then our choirs will sound like the rest of the world, but no one else on the planet has my exact voice with that exact color and tone and and all that so it's like i'm creating something literally that no one else can ever create and i think you can i guess relate to this like from a guitar tones perspective because i know guitar nerds are all about the tone it's the tone right so like how awesome is it when you create a tone from scratch like doing whatever you're doing versus oh just downloading this this pack that so and so created you know a hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's um I think it's a little bit easier not it's definitely not easier to do, but easier to have a unique singing voice than a guitar tone just because or at least in modern metal. Yeah. These days, like I don't even for a final product, I send DIs to my producer and I don't ask any questions. <laughs> which is not a good way to get go about getting a unique tone necessarily. But um, I think the reason that probably that most people will record with like composer cloud uh, choirs and, and all that stuff is just because they can't sing or yeah. can't sing that many parts that broadly. Um, like I can sing, but I can't sing the soprano part. <laughs> I can't, yeah. you know, uh, or whatever. And that makes a certain amount of sense. But you're a singer. Of course you should do it. You know, you're going <laughs> to um going to take the Hanzi approach, you know, blind guardian like he will just layer hundreds of himself. Um yeah. and so you'll always you can hear the blind guardian choir of choir of Hanzis and you just know that it's blind guardian. Exactly. Even if like even if you deleted uh the lead vocal Hanzi and inserted somebody else, you'd be like is that a choir of Hanzis? I think it is. So a choir of Vickies yeah. is a, yeah. is an instant being like it's tr it's a trademarked sound. You've got it, um, and you can't. Nobody else could do that with. I mean, I would love to have a plug-in of Vickies. You should, no that, Vicky you should for sure do that. Uh, oh, can you imagine the hours of work that would take? All the different vowels and. Oh I don't know how goodness. people do it. I mean, I that's really how they do it for know. for sample libraries, but Jesus, yeah, yeah, it's insane. <laughs> um, but hey, you never know. Like could be, could could sell a billion of them. Um, I'll I will be your first customer for the <laughs> awesome. Vicky plugin. Sign me up. <laughs> so, what would you say was the hardest song to write on the EP, and why is that? To, to write or record? To write. To write. Well, I guess we kind of answered that. No, Simon? Yeah, I think we already pretty much answered it. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's a good like, point. I guess if it was unnatural. if it was that one, then uh, um, then then we've already gone down that path. I yeah, will pick I another song. A song. <laughs> question. I'll pick another question. <laughs> I have so many. So very many of them. Um. Okay, here's a, a general one about that ki kind of relates to the thing that you were saying, like about people going, pointing out some specific little thing that you did, that you really, you know, you placed it there with such intention, a little Easter egg, and and they were like, oh, this one thing you did, and you're just like, yes, yes, you understand me. <laughs> Do you feel like in general, people are picking up what you're putting down? for all of the things that you're doing on this the the vocals the 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 music the lyrics the everything do you think that they're really getting it do you think you did a good job uh, did a good job getting it across to the people uh, should i answer that <laughs> absolutely um i feel bad cuz i feel like i'm talking for the most part so if if there's ever anything you really want to say simon just say it but uh, to answer this question, I think 
we did a pretty good job at least like with the two songs that we put out music videos for i think the visuals help the when you have a storyline it's kind of like you're spoon feeding the lyrics to the people and the story and all that um because let's be honest you know not a lot of people take the time to fully dissect a song it's really just like what's in the forefront that captures my attention and that's it but when you you're able to like really dive into the visuals and show people like that one line that's happening in the song in a visual form then they'll they'll catch it much easier for sure and um i think so i think we did a good job in that but then i think our music itself it's like so complex that you do need to sit down with it and have a lot of listens to to fully understand everything that's going on um like one of our friends listened to to the ep many times and he's not really like a huge fan like of extreme extreme music and uh like he likes his catchy choruses you know pop songs so <laughs> he was like i just wish he's like it's an ep you know it's a concept right he's like i wish at the end of the last song you brought back that like choir from remnants in time so like it goes full circle and i'm like dude that doesn't make any sense they're like two completely different <laughs> songs different vibes the choir makes no sense and i'm like it does go full circle because the very last thing that i sing on days before the world wept is as a remnant lost in time it goes full circle <laughs> <laughs> just not in the way you thought you know um, well, that's good though he's thinking he's thinking thematically at least yeah he's looking for that uh thematic repetition which was actually <laughs> there but he just didn't just didn't pick up on it yeah well, sometimes you got to really beat him over the head with it <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then he I just think... like look he looked at me he's like oh guess you're right then <laughs> right <laughs> i think one of the best parts of like um <laughs> of like making an album and having people hear it nowadays and you know when you're just finished releasing it is reaction channels on youtube right so this is like a great way to see if people reacted the way you intended them to react and like the comments and so just based on the reaction videos that i've seen and just that alone not even asking you know people that i know just based off that i say we did a pretty dang good job and yeah. it's always great to hear the because, you know, you'll have one video that will say, well, they really did this and that, and I would really like to see more of this and more of that. And then this is going to guide you in what you're going to do next, and you might not even, like, realize it. So, because you want people, every artist wants people to react to their art and, like, be immersed in their art. And, like, reaction videos are friggin' awesome for that, because it's, like, like for example, in Remnants in Time, there's like this rate, uh, the first bridge, basically the part that Donaldson wrote that you mentioned originally when we first started writing the song, that part was like slow. It was like Danny was like, yeah, we need to like slow it down and like groove it. Here's people can headbang, and I was like, hmm, yeah, okay, I see what you mean, but no, I just want to like keep on keep the party going, and it was like, eh, not sure finally it happened and like and then you see people that are like headbanging and then like what oh and then they're headbanging a completely different way but they friggin love it because it's like <laughs> it shook them around like like you're in a washing machine tumbling around like yeah. yeah man like and the only way i was able to know that is through like reaction videos on youtube so these things are awesome for knowing if you achieve that or not yeah and it's really cool too to see like the reaction videos that are a little more analytical. It's not just like, oh, I like this, I didn't like this, you know? Um, it's really cool to see what someone has to say after just one listen. Cause like I said, our, our music is a bit complicated and I think the more listens you have, the more you'll notice. Um, so it was really cool to see a few that were able to like catch something at the very beginning on the very first like listen i'm like wow that's that's awesome and uh another thing that i i really loved uh, i think we we talked about it simon too that like a lot of uh reaction channels when the song ended and the piano's just kind of on its own they were just like like, like not like saying in anything stunned. just like staring and i was like <laughs> I was like, good, no one talks over the piano. <laughs> I, was like, 
<laughs> you talk over the bass solo. Oh. Oh. But then there was the odd channel that like, oh, this piano. Well, I'm gonna stop you. So blah blah blah. No, dude. No. No. You 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 didn't finish the friggin' song. <laughs> That's funny. I never really thought about reaction videos as like sort of from the creator's perspective, but that's really true. I I want I want to see somebody react to my music. So far, I don't think anybody's ever done that. And um I always think it's funny that anyone watches reaction videos at all. Like I've done s- plenty of them at this point. I don't really understand why people like them. I understand why you would like to see somebody doing it for your react to what you're doing because you need that right? feedback. It, actually, it's one of my goals in life to get. Do you know that guy, Hardcore Keem? <laughs> I love Keem. Holy so shit. Funny. One of my goals in life is to write something that makes him go for the dummy. Like, fucking, I lose my shit every time. Yeah. He's like, ah, just runs off and takes a swing at the dummy oh my god oh um i think you just have to give him three breakdowns in a row (laughs) yeah i I think he'll do it yeah (laughs) i but i guess if i like watching him then i understand why people like like to watch reactions but yeah it's the person you're connecting with the person doing the reaction like i can i don't do reaction videos myself but i stream on twitch so pro streamer um but i have a button for that i I can relate because it's the same exact philosophy everyone thinks that like oh reaction videos are hot streaming is hot i'll do it too and then they start doing it and then they're like oh why aren't people watching me what's wrong it's not the content it's the person behind the content and a lot of those like top reaction channels right now it's people are watching them because the person that's doing the reaction has is offering something whether it's entertainment laughs um education like like tank the tech is very informative in his reaction videos for example and and people love that because they learn a lot from it so it it's the person it's it's not the reaction itself yeah i i think this brings up a, a pretty cool idea of like like, why is it that we make music? Why do we write songs and go to all this trouble to put in this work? Like you were talking about, like, you're like, why would I spend two hours on something when I could do it in two minutes and just not be a perfectionist about it? Yeah. And for me, it's usually, it's a, a very strong part of it is getting the reactions out of people. Not just reactions, not just like, ah! but like emotional visceral reactions from people and being able to share in that like getting finding people that like what you like too um but that's what i kind of part of what i do it for i'm curious if you guys have a a, uh, any other reasons that you like to write anything else about any other aspect of it that really gets you I mean, I think it's pretty much everyone has that, right? Everyone wants to write for someone else to hear it and and feel whatever you want them to feel, you know? But I mean, personally, like, I love writing. It's like therapeutic for me. But it's, you know, because number one, if it feels good to create something, but there's always that afterthought in my head of writing something and I'm, I'm sure Danny is the same way in a certain extent, to a certain extent that like someone's going to hear this and it's going to elevate them. And like that feeling, I think, is always there. Right. So like unless you're writing like super underground black metal and you don't want anyone to hear it ever because that's cool. <laughs> There's like 10 people that listen to it. Yeah. And that's like awesome to you. But like. <laughs> You know, I think it's just that feeling for me, it's like it's therapeutic to, first of all, create something that I can go back and listen to and say, hey, I did that. That's cool. I'm cool. (laughs) I'm doing something. I feel good. But also you can't wait until someone else is going to hear it and like feel something. And then that's that's simply it, really. It doesn't really go beyond that, does it? But it's so complicated in that simple little 
Like people could feel so many things. People could be hearing that somewhere and that could influence their life. Like so much can happen from you making that piece of music. And like all personally, just, just me talking, I'll, I'll always take it back to when I was a teenager listening to, you know, my disc man with my headphones, like blasting at 10 volume, like walking everywhere and just like imagining like images of like these people on stage and like just like metal and like, yeah, and like corn and Marilyn Manson and just like, this is me, this is who I am and like building my entire identity out there. And I just, I pray to, I pray to God there's someone else out there that's doing that with our music. For me, that's what it's all about. Like literally it yeah. doesn't get any better than that. And then of course you got go and get to play shows, potentially see that, you know, happening in front of you. And that's amazing too. But I mean, hopefully people are going to, are going to, are going to just like grow from grow themselves from the music that you made. I mean, that would, that's the yeah. ultimate goal. Yeah. I think, I think it's absolutely insane to think that you could inspire and influence someone to, to get into music, you know, like I heard this song or I heard your voice and I wanted to do it myself. Um, I, th yeah, I think that that's like mind blowing, but I mean, it, if I'm going to be like 1000% honest, when I f first started music, that wasn't even in the in equation, you know, like 15 year old me wasn't like, I want to influence the next generation like that that's so far-fetched that you, I didn't even consider that, you know. I think I would say that it, it is a little bit more selfish in the beginning. It is a little bit more, I'm doing this, I'm writing music because I just, I can't imagine myself doing anything else. Um, I wrote my first song on piano, going back to like the, the reason, actually it was Guitar Pro then. I didn't even have a MIDI keyboard. It was just like a you know, $150 Yamaha, you know, keyboard with four octaves or something. But, um, so I, I wrote my first song when I was, um, as most people going through a difficult phase in my life. And I literally hadn't eaten in two days. Like my hair started falling out when I was brushing it. I couldn't eat food for two days. And I wrote my first song on the keyboard, which I then transcribed to Guitar Pro with like a mouse like something you can do now in 10 minutes took me two days. And when the song was complete, I like transformed to a different person. Suddenly I felt good again. I felt like, wait, why was I, I mean, yeah, I was really upset. What happened was really bad, but I felt like, like it was therapeutic. Like it, it, I was like, if this didn't happen, then I wouldn't have written my first song and then I wouldn't be where I am today. So, um, yeah <laughs> got That's a little awesome. dark yeah <laughs> got a little dark there for a second but i think for a lot of people that's how it begins and at the end of the day even if you are in a professional touring band and you're writing songs for people to listen to i think you have to remember that that's where it came from that's how it began and like the reason why you started writing writing and that's why i encourage everyone to write music like it doesn't have to be, you don't have to become this like s exceptional songwriter that's doing worldwide tours and selling out shows and, and platinum records. It's like you do it for yourself first and foremost. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I love hearing that for a number of reasons, but also because... I see you really living it um, from from everything you've described in here. You guys, you're not bringing in outside songwriters or like, you know, having a producer write everything for you, which I think is like can be fine or whatever. Like some people do it, but you're you guys are just writing the music that you want to write and fuck what anybody else thinks. You're you know, you, you're still putting it out for the world. Uh, but you're just writing it for yourselves for other people also like there's it's got you're your primary audience and then you're also recording it so that you can do it for a living and not <laughs> just play it for yourselves for funsies um and yeah and I, so there's a therapeutic aspect to it of course as well you're you write it and you're 
you feel something you feel better you get get it out there for the world to hear or like outside of your you take it outside of your brain and make it real and i that's the part of it that i love too more than probably more than any other part of it i think and i love yeah. i love hearing a pro say that you don't have to become <laughs> fucking beethoven or you know Joni mitchell or something like you can just write songs because it's fun and great and nobody ever has to hear them even exactly so exactly. i appreciate that a lot <laughs> cool. here's a good one um i think this i think it's probably a good a good spot for us to uh to drop the final question and i'm thinking about making this a re- like a the always the final question for the podcast so you're, you're the guinea pigs here this might be this might wind up being a very big long one but what do you think is the greatest song ever written and why doesn't have to be a dissertation on why just a, just a, like the most important thing for you the part for you that really I probably should have given you this one in advance <laughs> <laughs> yeah dude but don't overthink yeah. it you just have to pick the single greatest song of all time. And if you get it wrong, you're fired. Don't overthink it. <laughs> Dude, but don't I overthink have, it. I had, I mean, something came to mind right away, but I, it just like the pressure of society. I just do not <laughs> want to say it. The pressure of music stores all across the world. Oh, no. <laughs> it's scary, Yeah, I want to say it. I want to say it. it. It's not the greatest song ever written of all time, but the greatest song for me in my journey was Stairway to Heaven because when I learned how to play the chord shapes in Stairway to Heaven, the world of guitar and music opened up because that song is like the ABCs of guitar, right? I don't need to say that to you. I'm sure you can play it backwards, but like, okay, fine. But anyways, that's probably the crazy. It's like it's got all the elements of a... <laughs> I can Touch, learn it. <laughs> so all the elements of a perfect song, right? You have the cool chord shapes. It's hard. It's not an easy song to play, you know? And then you have like, you have, it, it's it's a ballad. It gets heavy. There's melody. I mean, again, not the best song ever wrote, but it's probably one of the better ones that <laughs> people ever learned. <laughs> yeah. I think everyone that's going to answer this question from now on is gonna is gonna emphasize that they're gonna be like no this this isn't the greatest song ever written it's just my song the thing that i think of when you ask me this like we we gotta make sure we put that uh disclaimer I, there you yeah know? maybe i should maybe <laughs> i should word it what do you think is the greatest yeah. song ever written and then it, it's like my ego wants to say like emperor song is like or whatever like the crazy metal song is the best song but that's not the best song ever wrote come on come on <laughs> let's let's be real here yeah well I think it's a flawed concept to begin with, you know, but uh, this is where I think the importance of your own life and experiences and the order have a big part. Because when you ask, I hate being asked, like, what are your favorite artists? What are your favorite albums? I hate it because it's so hard because it's the only, literally the only albums I can think of and the only artists are the things that I listened to before the age of 18. Are they my favorite? Probably not. There's probably stuff I heard later on that's better and that's that's closer to my musical tastes right now, but they're just so influential that that's what you're always gonna remember. Um, and like, as you ask that question, a song popped in my head too, but it's, it, it's like, <sighs> It's even funnier because I'm a vocalist and this song doesn't have vocals on it. So I just, ju- I think, just spit <laughs> it out. It's okay if, it, like, I won't tell anyone. Well, it's fine. <laughs> it's, people only know. The hundreds and thousands of people who will hopefully watch and listen to this will yeah. know. Only them <laughs> and all the news outlets that report. No, go ahead. No, what? it's, 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 uh, I'm a nerd. Uh, whatever. Um, the first moment in time that I can remember music like grabbing me and being like crying over it was when I 
played games and uh the 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 most important game in my life is final fantasy 7 yes. um <laughs> everyone knows this about me everyone knows but uh yeah so like the the single greatest song that m made me feel something was uh Aerith, Aerith's theme when uh i guess spoiler alert that she dies in, in the game but everyone should know this by now i was bawling i was crying my eyes out for like weeks i was 10 years old and wow. and <laughs> it's the theme song i mean it's the thing it, the, the, the 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 scene itself but it's the theme song it's it's just so connected with the visuals and the storyline and the notes and I'm, I'm tearing up talking about it <laughs> imagine imagine vicky's parents trying to understand why why who is the, who <laughs> er, er, she where, died, where, where is she She's where dead. <laughs> in the game <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. like and there and she's like no you got to hear the song and the song is like beep boop beep beep boop 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 beep boop 8 bit and your parents are like oh jesus christ the child no, is this mad was, this was playstation so we had some quality here it was it was some, yeah it was like yeah. one step above but if you've never heard the song i would everyone do yourself a favor go listen to it don't look at screens don't don't look at any just close your eyes listen to it there are better versions. there's like there's like orchestral piano like versions now of it with better quality but um but yeah i i say it's so funny that i would choose that because like i'm all about like vocals and lyrics and music and telling a story and it's just like well this one didn't need that because it was on a game and it had the visuals but um it's yeah, I think that that's the the reason I started writing music on a piano and like trying to like layer instruments and stuff like that because that's like what video game music is, and um, yeah, it's just the moment the moment I heard it in my life. If I played this game when I was like twenty or thirty, maybe it wouldn't have that impact. But I was ten, and this this character is portrayed as like the most innocent, sweetest person and kind, warm-hearted person, and then she just gets brutally murdered, like, halfway into the game. That's that's cruel reality right there. That's a life lesson telling me, you know what? Life isn't fair. You could be the best person. You do all the best things in life. You still might die young. You still might get screwed over. That, that was a life lesson there, so. <laughs> that part in the game was arguably more important than school at the time. Oh, of course, of course. I, I, More I developing. Learned, yes, I wouldn't be who I am today without that, you know. So, cause, 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 another spoiler alert: what she ends up doing, what like she dies, but like what she ended up doing right before she died saved the entire world. So that was another life lesson for me, being like, you know what? Yeah, okay, you might die, but still, be a good person, be a good human being, be kind, influence people. You might die, but you might change someone's life in the meanwhile. So, um. I think I, I wouldn't, maybe I'd still be a good person, but you know, don't be a dick. Be good. Be kind. Be nice. It's not hard. <laughs> Life lessons from Final Fantasy VII. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everything I need to know about morality I learned from Final Fantasy VII. I mean. <laughs> it's a very influential game. I've, I, I, I've heard a lot of the music from that. I never played it. I was kind of a Nintendo kid. I don't know if it wound up on that. Uh, I was a Nintendo. I was like that kid who had a Nintendo and two games for it, and one of them <laughs> was Battletoads uh, in Battle Maniacs. Nice. Which so really, what I played was the first three levels of one game, because um, nobody's ever gotten past that fucking rocket level. Um, anyway, <laughs> the <laughs> uh, but uh, I think it's interesting that. When I asked this question, you both picked songs that were just very influential for you, ones that um, hit you very early on that um, sort of, they're, they're almost your uh, rosebud songs, you know, like that kind of like that thing that you're chasing forever now. Um, so maybe I should modify the question. Thank you for being my guinea pigs for that question, by the way. <laughs> um, Our pleasure. I learned I learned a lot, not just about from your answers, but also from how you answered it. How I should <laughs> maybe go about this from here out. Maybe I'll ask 
what is what's your what's the most influential song um of all time for you yeah yeah well, i think it's a great question i think it's going to make a lot of people feel uncomfortable because there's going to be one song that pops in their head and maybe someone will be like oh no i can't say that Fuck. <laughs> now what am i gonna say they would be like, uh, if you want to be my lover. Holy shit, I was just going to make that joke. I was no. just going to make that fucking joke. No, dude. I couldn't remember dude. the name of the song. Dude. <laughs> what is, what's the actual name of that song? It's, is it Wannabe. If you, wanna, it's Wannabe, right. Yeah. Spice, I was going to make a Spice Girls joke wow. 100%. Wow. Oh, <laughs> simpatico. <laughs> Um, that we, I like that we both picked the si- the one that would be the most embarrassing. <laughs> We're probably about the same age then. I was going to ask, how old are you? I'm 37. I'm 35. You're 37, 35. Okay. So, yeah. yep. There you go. Yep. Wild. A lot of, a lot of people watching this are like, what, what song is what? that? What is he what, talking, what are you about? talking about? <laughs> is that Justin Bieber or what? Um, that's, um. That's fucking hilarious. Anyway, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> well, I um, I love this. I love talking about this shit just like this. I um, I'm very excited to uh go back and and after hearing you talk about all this stuff, go back and listen to the EP again with all of this in mind, um, and and get a hopefully get even more of a sense of what you were going for and and enjoy it on a on a whole other level as I think all of you watch hello out there in TV land should do the same. Um, because it's, it's, it is just really great even without all of this fun extra information about how you went about doing it. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time on a Monday to hang out with your boy and, uh, and talk about this stuff. Congratulations on putting out this awesome thing, this crazy good EP um and <laughs> you're and great and uh, that's all i have to say about that so what um uh, outros are the worst i hate it the too. worst it's the worst i i'm on twitch like i at the end of the night and i'm just like okay goodbye everyone thank you so much and uh yeah have a good week and uh, and, uh i love yeah. you and <laughs> thank you and have a good weekend just like the repeat so yeah i, I get it I get it. <laughs> what um, what's uh, what do you want to push for the world now? What's the next thing that the agonist you want people to know about? Hmm. Any things coming up on the docket? I mean, we're standby for tours, so I don't want to get anyone excited because I'm I'm trying myself not to get too excited, just in case you know everything gets canceled again. Um. But do we have anything else, Simon? It's really, it's really that. It's really it's... these potentially awesome tours, you know, and potentially that are potentially nothing. awesome. Yeah, yeah, we're really just standby. Like we started filming a music video too last time I was there in December, and we only got like half of the music video done. So I can't even tell you guys when the rest will be filmed to be released. So. Um... It's really just those two things. When can we finish the video and when can we go on tour? <laughs> Rough. Um, but there's there's a whole back catalog of music for the Agonist um, and mu- awesome music videos from this EP you've, you've put out too, at least. Um, yeah. Highly recommend you guys go check those out. They're super fun to watch. And um, great, guys. Thank you so much. And hopefully get to talk to you again real soon all right absolutely always a pleasure thanks guys see ya on the flippy floppy bye Bye. (laughs) let me just end that real quick all right (laughs) i should probably find a a fun new way to end these uh, with a little bit less weirdness (laughs) than that um but you know it's just real, all right? We're just doing it, we're doing it live. We're doing it live, guys. Um, so that was super fun. Check out The Agonist, Days Before the World Wept. It's really super sick. <laughs> um, 
I enjoyed listening to it a lot, uh, binging it over this past week. So thanks for watching, guys. Be sure to check out my brand new songwriting course. There's a link in the description below, Complete Rock and Metal Songwriting, if you're interested in learning more about how I go about writing songs. Um, talk a lot about the philosophy kinds of stuff like I did here today with, with these guys. And um, we do this every Monday, 11 a.m. PST. I don't have a guest to announce for a week from today just yet, but I've got a couple in the works, and they're all super great. So um, stream on Friday for if you guys want if you want to get your songs critiqued by me, if you want me to listen to them and let you know what it is that I think that they need, I do a live stream every Friday starting at 1 p.m. PST. I know a lot of you guys in the chat, all um, are a lot of you are there very often. Uh, and of course, Vicky streams on, on Twitch pretty often also. If you see the video that we did together, um, she recorded all of her vocals, I think, for the song that we did on live on twitch also she's hilarious and does funny voices um definitely check that out and uh what was the other thing a couple of new videos coming out this week so you know we've talked about pre-production a ton somebody pointed out in the um in the chat earlier that a uh, kind of a, a recurring theme has been pre-pro on this stream. So I decided to do a video about pre-pro. What is pre-production? So look for that tomorrow. And I think I've said this probably in every <laughs> stream so far, but this will also be an audio podcast. That's happening very soon. Um, finally got a decent logo. That's really the thing that's been holding it back. I can't put out a, 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 a podcast with the logo that we've, that I've got on there right now. So, Thank you so much for watching, everybody. I will see you later this week. Have yourself a wonderful time and go write some songs, all right? And I'll see y'all real soon. Bye.